And with that, I want to introduce to you my brother in that struggle, struggle, our brother in that struggle, but our champion for that vision who will fight for that two days from now, but also who will fight for it in the decades to come, Candela. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Wonderful volunteer, wonderful nurse. Thank you for being a part of, allowing me to be a part of your movement. Um, and thank you, everyone here. Oahu. Everyone, I know folks came on from Maui, people watching outside on live streams. Just thank you so much on a, on a weeknight. Yeah. <laughs> thank you for believing that there's something better. Uh, I want to thank Havane, Tavana, for that beautiful Oli and Mele. Let's give them a round of applause. Carly, the school of the best and the interpreters that came out today for hosting us. And the first speaker, uh, Justine, 17 years, 18 years old, 17 years old. Uh, Justine, uh, let me tell you a story. She, she's an incredible volunteer in our campaign, and I've been holding these meet and greets all over Oahu, um, in, in like bars and coffee shops. We did one in Waipahu, in Tepreso. And there was one person who showed up, I'm like, well, you know, some, it's just my word of mouth on Facebook. Uh, so I started talking to this person, then I see this little hand rise up. And it turns out it was Justine, and she brought 20 of her friends, 20 18-year-olds, they're playing Uno. She's like, they're here for you, Daniela. So not only is Justine a future leader, but she's doing it right now. She has organized 20 18-year-olds on a school night to come out and get engaged in this process. And that's what this campaign, that's what this movement is all about. Right. I want to thank um, Uncle Walter, living legend, for speaking. So, Walter Bailey, Walter Bailey here was part of the original um, Protect Kaho'olawe Ohana. They occupied uh, Kaho'olawe when it was being bombed by the U.S. military for target practice. At the same time, it was happening in Puerto Rico, right? So these 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 connections, I think, we were so often often lost. But the thing about um, Uncle Walter is well, at the time they're like, yo, yo, you're too radical. Like, who's gonna speak up against the US military? You know, what, you know what else he said that? When folks fought for Medicare, when, folk, when working people rose up for Social Security, the suffrage movement, the civil rights, you were too radical, what are you doing, young people? Martin Luther King's approval rating was 20 something percent when he passed away, right? So, what we're doing now, demanding, right, demanding healthcare education, dignified lives, food on the table, housing for all. These things might seem radical years from now, but just like the Grand Canyon, where the whole local establishment was saying, no, we gotta privatize this place, you fast forward two or three generations, and it's clear, right, left, Democrat, Republican, rich and poor, we have moral clarity on our side. Sometimes we shall listen to beyond new voices. Ken Lawson, Professor Lawson, another living legend. His work with the Anderson, I mean, he's speakers, right? His work with the Anderson Project, uh, he helped me when, when you, know, you know how strong this, this prosecutor community is, this mass incarceration machine here in our state. Uh, we often don't make the parallels between what's happening here and the Black Lives Matter movement all across the nation and all other American cities. And actually, Native Hawaiians are the same rates, the same disproportionate rates when it comes to sentencing, incarceration, um, and we're actually exporting uh, our prisoners, to private prisons, our inmates, our family members, um, thousands of miles to Arizona, breaking apart, and we expect them to rehabilitate, being that far away from their family. You know what cost to send a, a child to visit their father 3,000 miles away, right? So, uh, just his work, helping me with bail reform uh, a couple of years ago, and everything, uh, calling uh, corruption out in, in our police department when no one else will. Um, yeah, it's just so honored to have this 
most importantly, most importantly, uh, mahal ko. Uh, my love, Cara Duvola, heard that uh, beautiful, poetic speech uh, that she gave. Um, I just want to say uh, thank you for changing my life. And thank you for opening my eyes to a new politics of what's possible. Uh, you know, we met, I was two years, two years in the legislature, and I was getting kind of cynical, right? You, you swim in the soup for too long, you think that's what the world tastes like. Uh, but she, she, she uh, no, reminded me of the urgency of these issues and why, um, you know, if, if we're not fighting for it, who will? Yeah. So, thank you, I love you. And of course, Alexandra. Flew 6,000 miles, just arrived today, gonna have to leave tomorrow just to be here with us to understand that as Justice Democrats, we believe in justice everywhere. Whether it's Oahu Law, the Bronx, Honolulu, Flint, Michigan, or Gaza and the West Bank. Our liberation, our liberation is connected to folks all over. I think as Kanaka Maui, we're starting to realize as people from products of plantation history, no matter where your, your grandparents and great grandparents come from, um, we understand that whether it's a war on drugs or a war on terror, it, they're really wars for profit and they're wars that are causing indigenous people all over the world to suffer just like we are here in Hawaii. So let's talk about that issue. Let's talk about that issue. I know it's been avoided in the campaign trail quite a bit, uh, especially by the Democratic Party. But when you go out to see what's happening in Israel, there are young Israelis that are holding signs and supporting the Palestinians there. There are Palestinians that want to live in peace with the Israelis. They're just asking for basic human rights. The people are not the problem. It's the far right Netanyahu government and it's time that the U.S. divest. It's time that the U.S. is not sanctioned. And understand, and understand that until everyone is free, none of us are. And because this movement is from coast to coast, we've seen not just Alex Rajah's incredible victory, but also um, victories all across the nation. Just a few days ago, Pramila Jayapal, who endorsed our campaign. You probably saw her on CNN. She's the congresswoman who shone light at the issues of the American Gestapo. ICE agents committing human rights abuses, tearing apart babies from mothers' arms. And she squashed this narrative that there's such thing as good immigrants and bad immigrants. And really just shifted the whole conversation. She just won a re-election just a couple days ago. Rashida Tlaib, Rashida Tlaib, our sister. At a time when Trump and the GOP is trying to block Muslim people from entering our nation, America just elected the first Muslim woman to Congress. <laughs> I'm Kaniela Saito <laughs> I'm a millennial father, I'm a Kanapo Weavey, I'm a proud mixed race, product of our plantation, product of immigrants, um, and I'm a progressive state legislator. You know, my mom worked at Liberty House, she sold shoes, a big five corporation, it's now Macy's. Uh, my dad was a, a LWU member, he was a hotel uh, waiter at a restaurant. So he passed away when I was around uh, 11 years old. So my mom was left with four kids and our grandmother on her own. And I remember her quite often skipping meals to make sure that we were okay. And we were raised very strong Republican. Very strong Republican. But no matter how hard I saw my mom work, how hard I had to work in the pineapple fields, uh, we couldn't get ahead. We couldn't survive without help from our teachers, our church. Um, like our teachers just drive us after school. I've seen some teachers here today. Um, to, they tutor me, even though they knew I understood the material, um, just because they knew I needed that attention. And they're driving a football practice after. 
um, public school teachers. And I know, you know, working shoulder to shoulder with undocumented folks in the field, I know that we came out on the other side with some hard times, but so many folks uh, aren't as lucky. And they're probably still out there in the fields today. All right, so that's why um, we're so grateful for that aloha that, we, that so many of us received, um, and why we fight for aloha for everyone else. So I fight for working families, because I come from one. People ask, how do you get involved in politics? Well, I didn't really, as a native Hawaiian, I didn't find my way into politics. Uh, politics found me, because it threatened my very existence. I got into Kamehameha schools in eighth grade. It was a real gift for our family. Uh, we are in financial aid. But there was a lawsuit that came down, a John Doe lawsuit, where they actually used civil rights legislation to claim reverse discrimination against a school that was meant for Native Hawaiians as the last um, deed from our, from our Princess Pauagi, right? Um, and very quickly, I was activated into politics. Uh, you know, a lot of marches. Johnny's nodding over here. Uh, but that didn't really translate to electoral politics or um, you know, more organiz organizing at a, at a broader level until college, when a Republican governor, Hawaii's only Republican governor, cut our university by $130 million. So it would have taken me two more years to graduate. Uh, and I got involved in student government. At the time, it was 70% in-state students, 30% out-of-state, but the student government was 95% out-of-state, run by one frat. Uh, my opponent was the vice president, his dad gave him $5,000 to run the student campaign. <laughs> But we did it just like we did it now. Um, we had t-shirts donated to us. We sold those t-shirts for $5. We did some cookouts and we won by 40 votes. And that's when we finalized our first socialist policy. <laughs> Bear with me. Bear with me. At the time, bus passes were $400 per semester, but only the poor kids needed the bus passes. $400. So what we did is we did a, took a poll, wildly supportive. Every student paid $10. Every student got a bus pass. Hey, maybe, maybe there's something to the politics stuff. So we, we organized we, we organize students and professors to the Capitol. We helped get some money restored. That's when I met Mark Takai. He showed me the things that he did as A2H, legis as A2H president. He showed me the, he the things he did as legislator. And um, we caught the bugs. So when I saw a Tea Party guy during the Tea Party wave in 2010 uh, win a seat in my home island, I knew that he's gonna sell out our island to his corporate donors. And if I had a problem with it, then it was my responsibility to change it, right? So at the time, I could count the amount of people who thought I had a chance on one hand, and half of them lived at my mom's house. <laughs> but we believe that our democracy could be driven by big ideas rather than big donors. So I worked at four seasons from 4 a.m. to noon every day, full time. Um, cleaning the locker room, cleaning weight rooms, and then I just knock on doors maniacally until sunset. And 15,000 doors later, we beat a Republican incumbent in a Republican district by 26%. And because we are free, thank you. And because we are free from that, from that money, from those lobbyists, we are able to fiercely fight for working people. In 2013, we passed marriage equality. Yeah. In 2014, we raised the minimum wage. In 2015, that's when I met uh, my mom, Kara, and we met when I was vice chair of public safety. She was a president of the Filipino Law Students Association at the time. And we're the only ones in the room that were opposed to a new private prison in Hawaii. Our matchmaker was my opponent, Doug Chin. He was your lobbyist at the time. <laughs> but we stopped that private prison. <laughs> I think in 2016, that's when so many of us got so, so re-inspired. Right? I was one of the few elected officials, I think one of four in the legislature, to publicly endorse Senator Bernie Sanders in the primary. <laughs> We stopped scrap natural gas from reaching Hawaii. We stopped the takeover of Hawaiian Electric by a mainland utility that was anti-solar. We expanded Papa Hanoboku Akeo, the national monument, and we passed the nation's first 100% renewable energy goal. All initiatives 
that even, even other Democrats, the corporate wing of their own party, was against. So this is the thing in Hawaii, right? Corporations that normally support Republicans anywhere else are forced to sort, support Democrats. And then we become reliant on their money and then we shift their way. So, arguably, although our people are rooted strongly in the workers' movement, although the people are strong environmentalists and progressives, the politicians don't often reflect that. Yep. Right? Arguably, we have the most conservative Democratic Party in the nation. I don't see other Democrats in, across the nation bragging about their Bayer Monsanto money <laughs> or bragging about their NRA endorsements. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So it's time for us, it's easy. It's easy in the Democratic part primary to fight Donald Trump. Every commercial you see on TV, oh, I have the courage to fight Donald Trump, look at me. He's, he's terrible, I'm awesome. That's not an inspirational message. 90% of us in Hawaii hate the guy. What's harder is standing up to the corporations and lobbyists, holding back change right here in Hawaii. That means corporations like Monsanto, that means monthly developers like Harvard the big five corporations that are still around today like Alexander and Baldwin. We're talking about you. But we blame systems, not people. So we're not saying that these managers are bad people. We're not saying that employees are bad people. They need to do what they gotta do to support their families. We respect that, we honor that. But when we come from a history of five missionary families having complete control over our government and our economy, and you fast forward 200 years, and two of those families are still the largest donor, are still the second largest landowner, and they have complete control already, they're the largest corporation, do they really need to affect our democracy too? Or is it time that we stand up and balance that out? Yeah. Don't name names. Don't name names. Wait, your, wait for your time. Wait for your time, right? Don't shake the cage. Have a law. They tell us this all the time. But if you actually, the people saying that, if you look at them when they're 20 or 30 years old, they were acting just like us. <laughs> And, uh, you know, aloha doesn't mean acquiescing to the institutions that want to profit from our suffering. Yeah. Aloha means ensuring interdependence and empathy and love and understanding and diversity. And the values I teach my son, the car and I teach our son, sharing for all of us. Right? So that's why we're reclaiming that word, aloha. Aloha is not for sale, we will fight for our aloha. <laughs> Alright, you know, you, have, you shouldn't keep your knees locked for too long. <laughs> Bounce around a little bit. So this campaign, we understood that these things that we did in Hawaii, we can also do all across the nation. As a matter of fact, if we want to affect change, we're going to have to. Within my son's lifetime, by 2050, by 2060, just 50 years from now, 40 years from now, Waikiki could be underwater. The neighborhood he was born in could be underwater. Uh, I was walking with him on the beach and I was thinking this could be but a dream. Right? Unless we act now, in the next 15 years, so these half measures, when politicians are saying, yes, maybe 100% renewable by 2055, or 2050, or 2045, no. We have the support from Bill McKibben and 350 Action, the top climate scientists, because we have a plan that will actually work. And that's a Green New Deal, 100% renewable energy by the year 2035 through a federal job guarantee. It's gonna get people working in coal jobs, and oil jobs, into better jobs in advanced clean energy. We can save Island Earth. We can save Island Earth. And if we want to teach our kids to surf, right? <laughs> We're the first, one of the first campaigns to talk about student debt cancellation. We worked with some of the best economists in the nation, Stephanie Kelton, Davina Chernova, and we laid out this plan. If we can afford to bail out B Wall Street and big banks who caused this crisis, and give them golden parachutes for $1.5 trillion, do we sure as hell can afford to give our generation a shot of life? Yeah. 
And we are sick, we are sick of these affordable housing yeah. proposals, aren't we? Yeah. Are we? They're ghost written by luxury developers, by the way. <laughs> you can't rely on the same institutions that caused the problem to fix it. You look at Kaka'ako, you see these luxury condominiums popping up to the sky every month. Condos going for $20 million a piece, right next to Native Hawaiians and veterans living on the street. The money is there. That scarcity is a political choice. It's just, we're building for speculative profit rather than local need. That's why we just rolled out the nation's first housing for all plan of just a couple weeks ago and it blew up. People are ready. In Singapore, all right, Singapore, Vienna, um, Sweden. In Singapore, it's half the size of Oahu. Half the size of Oahu is six million people. And on average, people pay 23% of their income for a brand new three-bedroom unit, three bedroom unit, brand new. I pay 40% for a one-bedroom unit for a family of three built 50 years ago, right? So it's a systemic problem. That's why we can't let luxury developers buy out our politicians. That's why we don't take their money at all. So we heard all these inspirational speeches. Yes, we do this work for my son. 70% of my classmates from Kamehameha moved to the mainland. Most of our kids are moving away. I don't, I, I don't know how Laguna's gonna make it, frankly, in 16 years from now. But I cared about these issues so much, but as soon as, as soon as she was born, it just became so much more urgent. So when you hear politicians saying, Kaniela, you gotta be more patient. We can't afford to be any more patient. When they say that these things we believe in are impossible, what they really mean is that it's inconvenient for their donors. Is it the people talking or is it the lobbyists talking? Right? So in this race, what we're saying is it's not just, these aren't just dreams. In order for us to live dignified lives, we have to have health care. We have to have education without being trapped in debt for the rest of our lives. We don't have to see our best friends moving to the mainland. We don't have to see our children moving away. We can have a livable climate. And we can have housing for all, right? But we have to get money out of politics first. There was a, there was a, a, a Hawaiian studies professor, and he was in court from a, for an action that he did uh, as a protester, and he spoke his native tongue. Hey, I'm right here. He said, I'm right here. And the judge said, I don't recognize the defendant. Is he here? He said, Eh, no fault, you me. Standing right here. The judge says, um, uh, you're gonna be held in contempt unless you show up to court. Eh, no In 2018, this man was arrested for speaking O-level Hawaii, an official state language here in Hawaii. So what we're saying in this campaign, not just Native Hawaiians, not just Native Hawaiians, because we share this struggle. Immigrants, working people, millennials, all of us struggling. We are standing right here. We will be seen. We will be heard. We will not be made invisible by these corporate donors. See, when our, when, when our great grandparents, so, so, so I just want to wrap up with this, right? A lot of, a lot of us, uh, we, we get told of this plantation history, right? And they're like, hey, things used to be so much better back in the day. We had everything taken care of. That's revisionist history, though. That's history told by the corporations. In real life, the first, the first plantation um, workers weren't paid at all. They were purposely taken from the poorest areas across Asia. And when they were paid, they were paid with plantation dollars that could only be given back to the very corporation that paid it to them. And they were bongos around their neck. The Japanese word for number. They're identified by number and not by name. The same tags that were used in the South, right? But what they did is they rose up across genders, across races, they couldn't understand, they were segregated into camps, so they couldn't or understand each other, so they mashed up their own language, Hawaiian pidgin English, which was, in a sense, my first language. Some were even shot and killed for demanding an eight-hour workday and a two-dollar wage. The people of Hawaii have rose up before, and we can do it again. If our great-grandparents didn't stand up to the corporate establishment of their time, we'd still be on the plantation.
And yes, they fought for their, their kids. Yes, they fought for their grandkids. Yes, they fought for our generation. But they also fought to live better lives themselves. They said, get these chains off our damn ankles. And we can do it too. We can do it too. I'm just so, look, we have two days left in this campaign, right? And it just means so much that you folks are here right now. The thing about these campaigns is, usually it, the message is this, right? Trump is bad, the opponents are bad, I'm good, look at my resume. Um, but that doesn't build power. These seats, they're just uh, relinquishing power, they're relegating power. Oh, I want a seat next to Nancy Pelosi, right? But what we're doing is building power. It's a completely different game. We're having people that have never voted before come out. I talked about Justine. 90% of our volunteers have never been engaged in a political campaign before, right? There are people that want to be politically relevant. They don't want to climb the ladder. They want better future. So I need you folks to help us in these last couple of days. I know it's a sacrifice. I know it's a weekend. But if we are able to um, sign a wave, um, can you commit two hours, just two hours on Friday and especially Saturday? Um, who thinks he can do that? <laughs> so last day, uh, all right, there'll be people with blue shirts and they can help you sign up or you can just go on the website and click uh, kanyelaing.com and click the volunteer button. Um, for those of you who didn't raise your hand, let me, one last thing. Um, you know, we, we learn in history not just to learn from our mistakes and to see what works, but also to understand why we, have to, we make sacrifices today. Because there are sacrifices that are made for us. Four generations ago, there was a woman in the Kalau Papa settlement. That's where, in uh, Molokai, where if you have uh, leprosy, Hansen's disease, you have to stay there. They're marooned at the time. And she had a baby. And the policy was at the time was if you have um, a baby in a settlement, you have to keep it in the settlement to not spread contagion across the islands. But before her child was able to contract the disease, she snuck him away with the mailman to live with her brother on Maui. She gave up that ultimate sacrifice for her child. That was my great, 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 great grandmother. And her name was Kekipi. Um, and her son never knew his name because at the time it was uh, illegal to speak Hawaiian in many instances. So I just found out that was our names just three months ago, right? And so we named our son Laguna Kekipi Jabola Aang. And you know what Kekipi, Kekipi means? The rebellion or the resistance. So make that sacrifice. We're just asking for two shifts, two hours, a knocking on door, making sure I'm full making, doing a lit drop, fighting the morning. Please sign up. Who can do it? We can do this if we change who votes, if we utilize the same day voter registration law that we passed, if we all take 10 people to the polls, we can win a better world. We can have the life we need. So thank you so much. And uh... all right, let's fight for Aloha. Take some ID down, you can register to vote and vote.